personalized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for the most part, it's it's just personal interest. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Well, like I said in the presentation, I wanted to talk to you more about things that you can do to be involved or to help monarchs as well. So I thought I would focus on three different things: um, rearing, tagging, and the gardening portion of it as well. And we can talk about um, if any of you have experience with any of those or the things that that I've done as well with monarchs. So um, I guess I'll start with rearing. If, uh, if you chose to do this at home, there's a few basic things you need to know. And really, I can only kind of scratch the surface while, while we're here. If you want to get into it, though, it's really not that difficult. There are a lot of resources available, not only on the internet, but there are places around, like RBG, where I work. <laughs> I run these workshops for people. Um, but the TRCA, there are lots of places that run workshops on um, actually get you handling monarchs, tagging them, building rearing cages with them so that you leave with tools and skills that you need to, to work with monarchs. Um, in terms of my being a pirate, <laughs> um, I'm not aware that that's the case. The most I can say is that the, the training that I took was through the Toronto Region Conservation Authority and the species diverse biologist. So um, from a personal perspective, where most of you are coming from, I, I don't actually think it's, it's really a concern. I, I imagine it would have been brought up to me if it, if it was in that training. However, they are, they, are a, they are a species at risk. They are not labeled as endangered or threatened, so they don't have specific protection. But um, you know, on behalf of an organization, it probably is something that you would want to consider if you do um, tagging with large groups, getting a license in fact. Nothing I had ever been handling. No, it's not the handling of them. That's the thing. I know that's not the case. Um, it's captivity. It's keeping something in captivity when it's listed as a species at risk. Um, yeah. Right? That's what it is. I was going to say the same way as the, the wood poppy. It's mm -hmm. an active species, so therefore you're not supposed to give it to other people or put it in your plants. In. That's right. Same thing. It's just. It is. It's around captivity, but taking it where it is. And we're saying, yes. yeah, yeah, but it's growing it's here. It's, <laughs> yeah. We need to propagate it. We need to grow more if it's at risk. Exactly. It's, it's, it's the same thing. It's the same kind of um, double-edged sword, I guess I'll call it. Uh, um, they aren't. They're sort of captive for a short period of time, I guess. But more um, of them are living the way you're doing it. That's that's my belief. Yeah. There are even those that would argue otherwise. I mean, it is a discussion. However, um, predation doesn't happen in my rearing cages. Mm -hmm. And predation is the biggest risk for an egg or a caterpillar on milkweed. So, um, so I bird, birds mostly. Uh, when they're that young, uh, it's often insects and spiders. Oh, right, that's right. Yeah, those parasitic um, flies, wasps, things like that get them. So when I am rearing them, I'll talk a bit about that. First of all, I, I'm really careful about the milkweed that I pick. First of all, I don't take it from a roadside that looks like it might be sprayed. I only take the best quality milkweed because basically if it looks like I would want to eat it, then I'll take it. If it looks like bad lettuce, I won't take it because I figure that the caterpillars probably feel similarly. Um, Sorry, when you, you talked about uh, not rearing them on the host plant, but is it no, you do rear them on the host plant. It's the, the person that asked that question in the audience was wondering if they actually pupate, so build their chrysalis on the host plant. Oh, okay. Yes, the caterpillars have to be on the host plant. Yeah. Um, I'm also careful when I pick milkweed that I check it out and flick off any spiders or other insects because then I would just be providing a buffet for that spider by bringing more, <laughs> bringing more caterpillars into this enclosure. With it. So, um, when you are, when you, if you do decide that you would like to um, keep monarchs to the point where they're they're releasable, you only need some basic tools. This is my favorite one. This is the one that I built. It's time to build a new one. But all I needed for this one was tool, which is pretty cheap at a at a fabric place. That's what this is called. Um, and then, as you can see from this, it's based around a tomato cage. So the top of the tomato cage is just bent over. And then um, when you wrap the tool around it, I sewed it onto the bottom so it's nice and tough. This can be placed over top of potted milkweed. It can be placed over top of milkweed in your garden. 
garden if you wanted to protect it that way. Um, or you can bring it inside and just put a bottom on it. They're little when they're first and second in star, so you need to have something to, to hold the bottom in place because they'll, they'll get rain out too if you don't otherwise. Um, so this is for actually, I started a little ahead of myself. This is for when they're a bit bigger. This is when they're full caterpillars. It works really well for classrooms as well because you can see in and there's airflow. Airflow is really important when, you're, when you have insects or anything like that in, in containers. So yep. is there a plant in there? Yes. So what I do is um, I actually take smaller than this, but I would have probably a mason jar something like that inside and I just take a few stems of, of milkweed, put them in water through a hole in the top so that the caterpillars don't fall in the water. And then I put that on the inside and put the caterpillars onto it. So you don't need a growing plant? No. I actually don't even recommend a growing plant because maybe for a classroom, it's, it's high maintenance to not have one growing. Depending how many you have. If you have one or two caterpillars, sure, put a potted plant in there. If you have five or six, they will eat through that so fast. That's, that's <laughs> what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. They, they eat a lot. So you keep replacing the stems. I do. I pretty much go out every day. I know where there's a milkweed patch, um, and I just snip a few leaves each each day, and I replace them for them. How do you move them over then? From when they are on, the I'd love to have a milkweed plant with me here right yeah. now. Um, when they're on a leaf, I don't even have something that acts as a leaf. When they're on a leaf um, on the old plant, I actually take the whole leaf. I touch them as little as possible. When they're between stages, if they're about to molt, if you disturb them, you can uh, disrupt that pattern. So I don't play with them. I don't pet them. I, you know, it's not. It's not like that. <laughs> um, they're really for observation, which is important in a classroom because the kids need to understand too that or children, your own children, if you do this with your own children, that they um, can affect that life cycle if they disturb them too much. So I snip off a whole leaf with the caterpillar on it, and I plop it onto a new plant. Leaf so and so how do you get in there to do that? This one. I just have open right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And will it cross it eat? They are going to be looking they, for the No, yeah, they, they mostly just eat. Sometimes they'll walk up to the top and walk around when they're about to molt. Um, this, this again, is really scratching the surface. I, I would, if you do decide to do this, you'll need to look into this more, possibly even take um, a little workshop on it so that you can get more information on this because there's a lot to it to cover in half an hour. Um, so keep that in mind. Now, when they're really tiny, though, if I have found an egg, or a first instar that is so small they would just, first of all, they might be accidentally cannibalized because they're so tiny. Um, and second, they would get out very easily. I, you know those muffin containers, plastic muffin containers with six little uh, divots in it? I actually use those. A little wet piece of paper towel with a piece of milkweed on top and the egg on the leaf. Um, and that's a nice contained small area. I can have one in each one and I can keep track of it, or something this size would even work. They're, they're itty bitty at first, I'm not going to close them in there without any air, but um, something very, very small for the young ones is important. And you don't have to get fancy. That's, that's kind of the point of rearing that I wanted to make. I mean, this is the fanciest one I have. This is what I collect them in. <laughs> very high tech. Very, very high tech. And you just sort of if they're on the leaf, you just sort of like... No, I take the whole leaf. You take the whole thing. Yes, I take the leaf. Nah. And I take it in this, and then I walk home and I put it on the plant that I have in water. Yeah. So, you don't have to have fancy equipment. I mean, if you want, this is kind of fancier. You can buy these. They're, they're much more expensive than this, but they are kind of handy. They fold up into this, if you want. Um, you can get these, but... You know, you can make an entire project out of this at home. You can start from scratch, build it yourself, reuse materials. It's a good lesson in a lot of ways, right? You don't have to buy new stuff to make this work. 